to that cross where you suffered and died the nails in your hands and the spirit in your side if I don't sing a song then my breath will show you everything that I am oh Lord I owe it on you look to that cross where you suffered and died the nails in your hands and the spirit in your side if I don't sing a song then my breath worship you everything that I am We want to dance in
That doesn't make you happy, I don't know what will. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, turn it for good. You take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, turn it for good. room right now have gone through things you've gone through through pain through turmoil but there's a choice to be obedient to be spirit led where his presence can move so right now I just sense his presence in here Jesus For those who who have gone through things, let them be obedient.
did this first service, and I just feel led again to do this service. If there's anyone in this room, you have unsaved children, you have unsaved grandchildren, if you would just please slip up a hand. There's hands all around this room. We are the church, we are a body, we are a family. If you see a hand raised right now, go to that individual. Someone just go to an individual with a hand raised. We're going to begin to pray for our unsaved loved ones. And we're going to believe. Our God is mighty. Our God's not even restricted by time. Go ahead, let's move around. Don't be shy. Pray for those of if, if they've raised their hand, call out their name.
according to the law, you're going to fail. You try to live according to what scripture says. If you, if you live according to what you're not supposed to do, you're going to fail. You can't achieve that on human, on flesh. You, you, you can't. Jesus said, I have to go so you can receive the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in this room right now. Tangible. My heart, my heart yearns and breaks for those who are bystanders of this. Who don't understand, who say, we, you're singing the same thing over and over again and not even grasping that are being said, being said.
place like this without the fear of the Lord to start. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. Hey, um, Pastor Bob always talks about where he gets uh, different ideas of where his sermons come from. And uh, before he even asked me to do this one, go ahead. You can start it in. Before he asked me to do it, this is where I get this one from. So let's start out. Here we go. See if it'll play. I like Southern gospel music, by the way. My wife doesn't. King Hezekiah rested in the warm sunshine. He saw Isaiah coming with a burden on his mind. Oh, Hezekiah trembled at the prophet's word. Set your house in order for the coming of the Lord. So I ride in my car, and this is what I'm listening to, and it hits me, and I'm like, wow, I don't know that story well enough. So I went back home, started digging into it. That's what you're going to hear this morning, Hezekiah. Judgment day is coming, we will all be there. Time to make atonement and you're so prepared. In the prophet. 
in order for, for the coming of the Lord. All right, see, even, even Zach likes that one. That's pretty good. Gordon Moat is the guy who's on there, and he's a blind singer, and he's backed up by, and if you want to hear some other stuff, he's got some really cool stuff. Gordon Moat. What, four, what are four things you need to be a growing Christian? Number one, you need to get into God's Word. Okay, And if you're in the men's Sunday school class, you've heard this several times before, but this is a, this is a key one for us. Get into God's Word, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Pray. That's number two. So the second thing you're going to do is you're going to pray. The Bible talks about praying without ceasing. Number three, we're going to meet together. That's what you're doing today. Okay, and we haven't done a good enough job of that in the last year. We haven't met together on a consistent basis because we've had all this stuff going on. We can't go together. We can't. We're supposed to meet together. Amen. Number four, you're supposed to find a mission. You have a mission. God's designed you to, to spread his word. You need to find your mission. You know, we do need some people. I'm just going to give a shout out here. We need some people to help out with some kids programs in, 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 this, in this church. And somebody needs to step up and start doing that, and that may be something you're called to do. Well, let's get into what we're talking about with Hezekiah. 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20 uh, and verse 1, and I know I'll, we'll throw a bunch of these up here, but if, you're, um, if you have a Bible or if you have an app, and when I say that, a uh, Bible app's pretty cool. Mine, um, three times a day, this sounds really weird, I didn't tell Zach this one, three times a day, mine dings. It gives like dong, dong, it dings. 8.04 is one of them, okay? 8.04 p.m. tells me I should pray before I go to bed, okay? It, it gives me a Bible verse for the day, does all kinds of things. You can do this, right? Okay, that's part of what we're talking about. But in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1, In those days Hezekiah became ill, was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, said to him, and it came to him and said, This is what the Lord says, Put your house in order, because you're going to die. You will not recover. Now, that'd be pretty tough words to say. Now, you have to remember, first, how did we get to this point where Hezekiah has this said and prophesied over him? Number one, we talk about Isaiah the prophet. A prophet in the Old Testament is somebody that didn't make a mistake when they're telling us what God says. Listen to that. They never made a mistake, because if they did, they were dead. Now, standing in front of a king and telling him, you're going to die. Put your house in order, you're going to die. That's not exactly a fun time for Isaiah. Second part is, if the king was really mad and not a good king, um, the prophet usually died anyhow. Okay? You didn't really want to be a prophet. That wasn't like, hey, that's my calling. I, this is going to be great. I'm going to get all this stuff because I'm a prophet. No, no, it went the other way around. You didn't really want to be the prophet, but if God calls you to do something, you better do it. So Isaiah the prophet Next thing we need to know is we have a unified kingdom of Israel at the start. And remember, we had Saul, remember Saul, and David, man after God's own heart, and then Solomon, remember that? And then it all fell apart. And we have a northern kingdom of Israel, and we have a southern kingdom of Judah. They split because Solomon didn't set his house in order at the end of his life, and therefore his sons weren't ready to govern after it was over. So we have these two. And then with those two kingdoms all the way down, and if I read down through there, I mean, there's, a, there's big lists, right? Okay, I threw the list up here on mine. There's a big list, all of them, okay? And with that list, about two-thirds of them are bad, bad kings, because absolute power corrupts absolutely. How many have heard that one, right? If you have absolute power, you think nothing can go wrong. I'm in charge. I can do everything. Well, Hezekiah wasn't that kind of king. He was the good king. We're talking he was the best king of all of them. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, I was talking to Nancy this week, and she said, well, what are you going to speak on? I said, Hezekiah. She said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, Hezekiah was the best king ever. Well, who, who said that? God did. And God did, said he was the best king. Wait till we get into Scripture. We'll show you this one. So, the kingdom was divided. Both kingdoms, again, went through more evil king than good kings. Hezekiah is a good king. 
chapter 18, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, the king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3 says, And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Now remember, when they say father, they talk about like father Abraham had many sons, and everybody who's a descendant considers Abraham their father. Now we would say grandfather, great, 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 grandfather. We can trace lineage all the way back. That's what they're saying about Hezekiah. All the way back, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Wouldn't that be great to have somebody say that about you at the end? He did what was right. Well, who says he did what was right? God did. He did what was right. It's in the Bible. If you believe the Bible is God's holy word, then you're going to believe that he did what was right. Well, what kind of things did he do? Well, it's pretty tough to do some of the things that Hezekiah did. He didn't do things that were easy. The previous kings before him were evil. It lists them out in the Bible. They were evil kings. That's not good. Again, what kind of things did he do? He got rid of idols and returned Judah to worshiping the God of Abraham. He got rid of idols. He got rid of stuff that was bad. He took on the fight. He did it in his own house, and he did it throughout his own kingdom. He took them on. Verse 4, he removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars. He cut down the wooden image and broke pieces, uh, the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Moses made a serpent. Okay, and the people actually started worshiping this thing instead of using it as like, oh yeah, I remember what, what it was like when Moses was there. They actually started worshiping it as an idol. So he cut them all down. Verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor that were there before him. He was the top guy. Verse 6, for he held fast to the Lord, he didn't depart from following him, but he kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. You know those ten things he came down with, those ten commandments? He kept them. He didn't worship idols. He didn't allow his people to worship idols. He tore them all down. Now, does that mean he's going to have opposition inside the kingdom? Potentially, right? You're going to have some potential problems. But the bigger problem comes in verse 7, the Lord was with him, he prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Because the king of Assyria is telling everybody, you have to worship our gods, you have to do what I tell you, and Hezekiah says, no way, we're not doing it. It may cost us, but I'm standing up for the one true God, this is what we're going to do. Now, you have to remember, Assyria is not like some little kingdom thing at this point. They're huge. Northern Iraq, okay? You've heard of Syria. Well, Assyria. The Assyrians were massive in military might and structure. They had conquered multiple kingdoms throughout the area. No one stood up to them. They were brutal in what they did. Verse 11. Then the king of Assyria carried Israel away captive to Assyria. So the northern kingdom is gone. They're captive. The only ones left is Judah. That's it. And he put them in Hala by, and by the harbor in the river Gozan and the cities of Medes. Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, but transgressed or sinned, against his covenant, and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded, and they would neither hear nor do them. So Israel is no more as far as being governed. They had a king, and they still had descended lines, but that king is literally serving the king of Assyria. This is pretty tough. Then the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh, from Lashish, and with a great army against Jerusalem, to King Hezekiah. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they'd come up, 
They went and stood by the aqueduct in the upper pool, which is on the highway to the Fuller's Field. In other words, they're right outside Jerusalem with a massive army. You know, when the king says, oh, I'm not going to do what you tell us to, the king of Assyria sends all his men over and says, oh, yes, you are. And we're going to force you to do it. You're going to have a choice. That choice is, are you going to do what I tell you to do? Or are you going to do your own thing? If you do your own thing, you take the consequences of your actions. The Reb Shekhar said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this in which you trust? In other words, who are you trusting? Are you going to trust the king of Assyria? We win everywhere we go. Or are you going to trust the God of Hezekiah? who's just come on the throne and changed everything. I mean, look, you don't have uh, all the other gods you used to worship. They're gone. Are you going to put all your trust in the God of Jacob? Verse 28 says, Then when the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and spoke, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you from his hand. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. So that's what Hezekiah is saying. The Lord is going to save us. He's going to take care of us. Now it's coming to the point where the king of Assyria sent his man and says, that's not going to happen. Look at all these other kingdoms. We've taken all of them over. They have all their other guys. Nobody saved them. And Hezekiah should be out. Chapter 19, verse 1. And and so it was when King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Does that sound like a king? Listen, he tore his clothes. That's in re an act of repentance. He covered himself in sackcloth. He fasted. He went before God and said, Deliver us, O Lord, and what's going on? He called for Isaiah. He sent Elikim, who was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and the elders, the priest, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, and said, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. For the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. In other words, we're ready to be rescued, but we have no strength. We don't have an army that's like theirs. We're not as massive as they are. What are we going to do? We have to rely on the Lord God. That's what we have to do. And that's why, why he was in sackcloth, repenting and asking the prophet. Verse 4, It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the Rapshakeh, whom is the master of the king of Assyria, sent to reproach the living God and rebuke the words which your Lord your God has heard. In other words, he's, this king of Assyria has blasphemed God. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. There's just a small group of us, and we're asking God to deliver us. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servant of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Now remember, this is Isaiah. If Isaiah makes a mistake in hearing the words from God, he's dead. You know, we have a lot of prophets today. People say, I'm a prophet, and they say all kinds of stuff, and then it doesn't turn out to be true. You should not follow them, period. Let's go on. So as we look at this one, the king ultimately dies from his own hand. The king of Assyria will ultimately die from his own hands. Isaiah, the words he said were true. But here's the cool part. Verse 35. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And then, 
And when the people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. So here's the king of Assyria's army ready to go in and take over. They're going to attack Jerusalem. It's going to be awful. There's not enough people there. And when they wake up the next morning, they're all dead. Now, it says they're all dead and they were attacked by the angel of the Lord. That doesn't mean that they just rolled over and died. That means it would have been a gruesome, with swords, death. So, Shinarib, the king of Assyria, departed and went away and returned home and remained at Nineveh. That's a pretty cool story, isn't it? I mean, here's this guy, his back's against the wall, everything's, everything's bad. Do you think he's walking with the Lord? And I'm talking about Hezekiah. Was he walking with the Lord? In everything he did, right? I mean, here's a king who could do no wrong. He has all the power he wants to do. Instead, he's on his knees in sackcloth, asking and begging and pleading with God. He's a righteous man. Would everybody agree with that? Yeah. This dude is righteous. He's doing everything right. He tore down idols. He tore down all this stuff. He did all this, and it's tough, but he's still doing it. And the more he does it, the closer he aligns himself with, with what God's will is. You know, that's no different in our lives either. The more we gain an understanding of what God's Word says, the closer we gain to living a righteous life. He used to have a college professor, and he'd say this. You take everything that you know is right and wrong, and you filter it through the grid of Scripture. And what Scripture pulls out as truth is truth, and what falls through is garbage. Now think about that for a second. Do you know enough Scripture that you would be able to say, I know that's right or wrong according to what God's Word says? One thing I like about Pastor Bob, he's open enough that uh, when, I, when we first came here and first started uh, coming to church here, we were like, uh, you do realize that I don't care about anything you say other than it better be scriptural. He said, I know that. He understood. That's the big key. It's not something obscure and wild and crazy. It's something about what does Scripture say about this, and I, that's the way we ought to live, and that's what we ought to be doing. That brings us to Hezekiah's problem that we started with in verse 1 of chapter 20. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and, the, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, said to him, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. If you're Hezekiah, are you going to pray about that? Are you going to ask God to change his plan? Yeah, you are. You're like, Hezekiah's like, I don't want to die. It's not my time. I'm, do I'm doing all this. I don't want to die. You know, in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Confess your trespasses or sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. This, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You've all heard that one, right? Okay, and we're saying man or woman at this point, a righteous person's prayer is heard. Are you hearing this one? A righteous person's prayer is heard. Here's a guy that through his whole life, he lived an honorable and righteous life. The Bible says he did. Now, he made mistakes, like he told the king of Assyria, here, let me show you what we have. And um, he showed them some of the treasure that they had, and ultimately that's why the treasure was carried off. We don't all make great decisions all the time in our lives. But if we're trying to live a righteous life, that's what we're called to do. He got rid of the idols. He worshiped God in spirit and in truth. He did what the Lord required. You know, if you say he did what the Lord required, you know, he lived justly, walked humbly, right? Here's a humble king who kneeled. And he prayed. Does his prayer matter? Well, the Bible shows it does. Remember those four things I talked about right at the start? How do you know that you're desiring things that are righteous? Number one, you get into God's Word. 
Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. I can say that today. When I was a kid, I didn't say it. I sang it. You're like, what? Yeah, I went to this little thing. Um, this lady in my hometown named Grace Lewis um, opened her home up and had a good news club. Anybody ever heard of good news clubs? Okay, in northern Indiana, they're a big deal. She had good news clubs. She opened her home. In came these people and, and little kids, and I'm going to say third, fourth, fifth grade kids, they all packed into this lady's basement. She opened her basement up, and we learned about God's Word in her basement. Sounds interesting. It was all about Scripture. We didn't know that. We sang Scripture songs. Interesting. Roger. Roger memorizes all kinds of stuff. He's got, it all, he's got a lot of stuff memorized. I mean, he just starts quoting Scripture like crazy, because when he got saved, that's what he did. Okay? He reads and memorizes. Great. Okay. Do you memorize well? You know, God's word, the word of, is it hidden in your heart somewhere? There are certain things that when phrases stuck, come out, you can remember them. Me, with songs. That Southern Gospel song sticks in my mind every now and then. There's other ones that stick in my mind. My wife says my mind gets stuck all the time, but <laughs> there's stuff that sticks in your mind. Hopefully it's Scripture. Years ago, I taught class, and 37 years ago, I was teaching in Covington. And I had Pastor Bob as one of my students. That was a trip. <laughs> and I can say that. Um, but we had a computer class, okay? And in computer in those days, guys, now, computer today, you got computer in your phone, you got all this stuff. Man, this is really cool. I can type this out. And we can do no, 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 that's not what we did. And how many of you know the if-then statements all the time? Because you had to program the computer. See, he's looking at me going, what? If-then? What do you mean? Yeah, that was the big deal. If-then. If this happens, then this happens. And I'm telling you right now, garbage in makes garbage out. God's word in gives you a chance to understand what righteousness is. You can, you can discern much better if you have God's Word in your heart. For men, it's hard because they don't read well. So you better be in some kind of music that glorifies God. You better have some type of thing that is good going in, which in this case would be, let's see. Well, I have a Bible app. Can I push on my Bible app and have it read Scripture to me while I'm in the car? Yes, there are things you can do like that, right? You're like, well, we have tapes and videos. Yes, all those. Straight scripture, great opportunity for you. That's number one, get into God's word. The more you put in, the more you get out. God has asked each one of us to draw close to him. In the Beatitudes, it says in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. How do you hunger and thirst for righteousness without God's word in your heart? Doesn't happen. Two, pray continually. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Yes, I pray when the guy's going to kick the extra point. Okay? Or when we're throwing a Hail Mary, right? That's what the whole thing's about, right? You know, if you're Roman Catholic, it's Hail Mary. If you're not, you're like, Lord, let him catch that thing. Let him throw it down there. And I've seen him happen good and bad. And yeah, well, that's not what we're talking about as much. But we're praying continually, praying for our kids, praying for a family, praying for our grandparents, praying for a church, praying those things. When they cross your mind, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Pray continually. Pray for your work. Pray for the people at your work. Pray for the people you're going to come in contact with during the day. Start the day out. Lord, give me an opportunity that I can witness and help other people throughout my day. And I can be a blessing to somebody. Start your day out in prayer and throughout the day doing that. You can pray with your eyes open. You can pray going down the road. I do on my way to the northern kingdom. That's Seeger, if you hadn't figured that out. 
Number three, meet with the body of believers. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as, in the, as is the matter manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. We see the day approaching, that's the end, right? Or the day of the coming of the Lord, because it's both. We're either going to be raptured or we're going to meet him when we pass away. Either way, it's going to be great, right? But we have to be prepared. We have to put our house in order of what's going on. And this one says we need to meet together so that we can, and I say, sharpen swords. Anybody ever have a grandma that had a steel and a knife and she sharpened it and you would go, whoa. Anybody, anybody have a grandma or a grandparent like that? You ever seen a butcher do it? And you're like, wow, that is awesome. Iron sharpens iron, steel sharpens steel. The only way that you're going to have somebody that you can have an accounting for is if you have a body of believers that you know know what's going on with you. It's hard in a large church. It's a lot easier when you have 10 guys in a room down here because you get to talk about all kinds of stuff. And yeah, I'm promoting our men's um, <clears throat> Sunday school class study because those guys care about one another down there and I've heard all kinds of stuff going on down there that I've never heard in a men's Bible study before. <laughs> it's really cool. I mean stuff that's going on, stuff that guys have repented of, stuff, all kinds of stuff. That's what needs to happen. That's what they're talking about. Meeting together, sharing your faults, having yourself build up, directing your path, holding somebody accountable. That's what we're talking about when we say meet with a body of believers. Number four, find a mission. That mission can be working with our kids. It can be going across. The Bible says a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, right? What have you done for your neighbor during the pandemic? What have you done for other people during that? What is your mission? The Spirit of God is going to call you to do things. He's going to prompt you to do things. When the Holy Spirit does that, powerful things happen. God allows them all to happen. And when I say that, that's kind of the way it works. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's not Pastor Bob's job to save Covington. It's ours. It's not his job. His job is to encourage us to preach God's word, to have it have some impact and grab some footing in what we do. Our job is to reach our neighbors, not his. Our job is to reach our family, not his. And if you put that in perspective, it changes when it says you have a mission. It changes the whole thing. Now, if I go back to Hezekiah, righteous guy, okay? Did he know God's word? Yeah, or he wouldn't have gotten rid of the idols. Did he pray? Is there evidence he prayed on a continual basis? Yes, there is. There's evidence he prayed. Did he meet with other believers? Well, he called Isaiah and he met here and he brought these, right? He always had something going on. How about number four, did he have a mission? Sure, God told him different things that he would ultimately do. So here's the righteous man. Without me finishing the story, did he live longer than dying right away? Yes. And it happened before Isaiah, verse 4, had gone out in the middle court. The word of the Lord came to him saying, in verse 5, Turn and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of the David of your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, and surely I will heal you. And on the third day, you'll go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. God knows your days. He knows mine. He knows what's going on. Live your life. And I'm not going to say with reckless abandon, but with an understanding that God has your days numbered 
and that if you're doing God's will, he's going to protect you up to the point where he wants to. And in this case, a, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. How do you become righteous? Look at those four things I gave you. Four ways to, to really look at what you're doing to become righteous. It's not perfect. We're not all perfect. Zach even alluded to that before we, we, we talked here. The Spirit of God, we can't uphold the entire law. It's an impossibility. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we have the Spirit of God that prompts us and moves us and puts us in the right position to do things. If we're listening to God's Spirit, if we're in His Word, if we're praying, if we're doing those things as I'm closing, then God's going to do miraculous things with you. He'll prolong your days. He'll allow your will to be more like His will. Isn't that interesting? Listen, He'll allow your will to match up with His. Boy, we don't do that very much in this society. It's all me, me, me. The more you listen to God's Word, the more you are in tune with what He wants you to do, the more your will lines up with His. God will call you to do certain things and you won't hesitate to do them because He's called you to do things that are important to Him and you'll know it. That's because you're walking with Him and not against what He says. Interesting story at the end with Hezekiah. He gets to be healed. He has to do certain things to do it. It's not like it's all easy, right? Is your life easy? Mine's not. It's never easy. Okay, my wife's got me working on bathrooms, everything else. It's driving me crazy. Okay, I've torn apart half the house, put it back together again. Life's never super easy. Oh, there's always a problem, right? I haven't cut my finger off and come close twice. Look at all the things that are going on in your life. When you're praying and asking for something, you may have to jump through hoops. You're asking for healing within your family, you may have to go to counseling. You may have other things that have to happen. Hezekiah had those. He had to jump through a couple hoops. But here, listen to this one. The sign, then Isaiah said in verse 9, this is the sign you get from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing which he's spoken. The shadow will go forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees. In other words, the, the sun's shining and the shadow's falling. And he's like, no, watch. This will prove that that the God of heaven is in charge of you, this shadow will move forward. It won't be shadow back here, it'll move forward. And then it'll move, I'm like, oh wow. Something that is supernatural is going to happen and that will prove that I'm going to prolong your life 15 years. Now I'm not saying God's gonna give you those, but what he is gonna do, he's gonna line your life to what he wants to do. Four things to do. He said he put water up there. I'm glad I didn't drink any today. Four things to do. One. What's one? Pray. You got your Bible. One's Bible. Something get into God's word. Two. Pray. pray. Three. Meet together. Meet together. And four. Find your, Find your mission. So. You've gotten those. Isn't that weird? It sounded like I was a teacher and got you to remember something during the day, doesn't it? It's true, though. You put those four things together, God's going to have an impact on your life. You're going to live more righteous and honorable. And the prayer of a righteous man avails much. The prayer of a righteous man avails much. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to learn biblical truth from Hezekiah, allow us to rely on you. Allow us to put our focus on what you would have us to do. Allow us to tear down those things in our lives, the idols, the things that don't belong to you and don't glorify you. Allow us to live a more righteous and understanding life that we can thoroughly understand your will in our lives. 
Father, allow us to, to focus on your son and your son, Jesus, who died for us on the cross and gives us that chance for eternal life. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hopefully this week you put some of that to use. You do those four things. Start with number one, get in your Bible. Good things in, create good things out. You're going to pray more, even with your eyes open driving down the road. You're going to pray more. And then you're going to think about the last two, about what you're going to do. Consistency in meeting together, sharpening yourself with other believers, and find that mission that you need to do. Let's stand as we close. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May He turn His face towards us. May He may grant us peace and allow us to come back this next week that we would glorify You in everything we do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thanks, buddy. <laughs>